Happy New Year, everybody. Hello, and welcome to our complimentary virtual seminar on wills and trusts. I'm Sal Carrera, Development Director for Vegas PBS, and we're delighted to have you join us as we discuss these important topics in planning for your future. Vegas PBS is uh, committed to engaging the community with experiences that educate and empower individuals. And seminars like this uh, could not be possible without the expertise of our plan giving council members who lead these events. Today's seminar is going to be presented in by, by three trusted and well respected members of the Vegas PBS plan giving council who are Rob Bolick, Shannon Evans, and David Strauss. So as we get this seminar started, I wanna take a moment to quickly share today's format with you all. Today's seminar is gonna be presented in three segments with each presenter giving a short presentation on the topic of wills and trusts. So without further ado, we wanna get straight into this program and allow time to submit questions for a question and answer session that's gonna to happen towards the end of today's program. So I'd like to start by introducing our first presenter, Mr. Robert Bolick. Robert's an attorney representing his full service estate planning and asset protection law firm, serving clients through all stages of life. He's dedicated to developing customized plans tailored to fit individuals' unique needs and protect their interests. Robert has, has drafted and modified countless estate plans over his 30 year career, his 30 plus year career as a Las Vegas estate planning and asset protection attorney. From highly complex multi-million dollar estates to simpler wills and living trusts, Please welcome Robert Bullock, who will be presenting on what is a will versus a trust and the types of trust, the role of successor and professional trustee, and responsibilities of fiduciaries, executors, and trustees. Robert Bullock, take it away. Thanks, Sal. <clears throat> okay, so topic is uh, wills, trusts. Let's start out with a will is better than no will, okay? Um, Basically, if you have a will, you have the ability to make your wishes known. You can direct how the assets are going to be transferred. You can say who's going to be the personal representative, executor of the estate. And you can also, another thing would be to like to waive bond, which a lot of people miss out on that. Uh, an example there, have a client who uh, wife died. Um, Everything was community property, which doesn't avoid probate because it was in her name only. And so and so we filed a petition for him to uh, have him appointed as the administrator of his wife's estate. Um, but of course, because there was no will waiving bond, he had to post bond. And he was kind of upset as like, so what you're telling me is I have to pay $5,000 to post a bond to protect me as a beneficiary from what I may do to myself as the personal representative of the estate? And the answer is, well, actually, I didn't make up the rule. That's the Nevada statute, and the judge has no discretion. And it's like, I'm sorry, that's the way it is. So, so again, having a will is better than nothing because you can, in fact, make your wishes known. Um, a lot of people think uh, under the misconception that if I have a will, that means I avoid probate, which is not the case. Um, will equals probate. Uh, I tell my clients um, essentially a will is considered that as a formal invitation to your heirs to go to court. Um, and so yeah, they, it, avoiding probate, no. Uh, David's going to be talking more about what probate entails and whatnot. Uh, generally, um, going to court is go is that's what's good for attorney attorneys like to go to court um probate involves time money aggravation it could be contested so forth and so on um basically kind of the bottom line here is if you like i tell clients if you like your attorney more than your kids definitely get a will because that's good for the attorney if you happen to like the kids more than your attorney then get a trust because that avoids probate uh, oh, one more thing is on the, if you die without a will called intestate, um, another thing which throws a lot of people off is that you have to have a Nevada resident be appointed to administer the estate. So if you have a will, you can name 
children that live in other parts of the country, whoever you want to can serve as the uh, personal representative of the estate, but not if you if you don't have a will. So that's a little uh, problem there. So essentially how you can avoid probate, going to court, not really good, is to get a trust. And so with a trust, there's two kinds of trust. You have a living trust, family trust, revocable trust. What this says is that you can, so you create the trust, either single person, husband, wife, unmarried couple, whomever, brother, sister, you can do it. So you can create the trust. You are the trustee, you're in control of everything, you're the beneficiary, so you basically do whatever you want to. The, you're just creating this entity, this box that you put your assets into. And the concept is that when you pass away, the trust doesn't pass away. So the trust acts as a will substitute and you would put within the trust all of the things that you would normally put into the will, such as so-and-so gets this and somebody else gets that, and then we're gonna divide all the rest equally among the kids, or we don't like the kids, we're gonna have give it to whomever. So you can put whatever you would otherwise put in a will inside of your living trust, and that acts as the will substitute. Some of the things that typically go along with the package is you have the trust itself, which is the brains of the outfit. Then you have what are called pour over wills, which says if you're less than perfect, you've got some assets outside of the trust, then those can be transferred, poured over into the trust at death and then distributed through the trust, um, which like to do that, have the assets administered through the trust because you can put a lot of safeguards in the trust that are not otherwise available like in a beneficiary designation or a joint tenancy. Uh, just real quickly, um, a joint tenancy is one person dies, it all goes to the other. It avoids probate, but in the case of like a husband and wife, it's most mostly um, the equivalent to a probate deferral rather than avoidance because eventually, you know, both parties are gonna pass away and that's when you do the probate. So. That's not the best way to do it or beneficiary designation. Some of the things that, some of the issues that can arise are with a beneficiary designation or joint tenancy, it doesn't take into account some of the things that can happen in life, you know, such as uh, one of the kids is in the middle of a divorce, might not be the best time to inherit something. Somebody just filed bankruptcy. Somebody's, you know, addicted to drugs or whatever. They've, uh, whatever the bad things that happen in life, what you don't want to do is have the assets go to the beneficiary uh, in a way that it's either going to harm the beneficiary or the beneficiary isn't going to get it. It's going to go to somewhere else. So within a trust, within a living trust, you can, provide for those contingencies that say we're going to protect you against the rest of the world and from yourself so that no matter what happens the bad things uh, we basically consider it as we're just going to turn off the faucet on the distributions until the unfortunate thing goes away and once the coast is clear you're able to receive it we just turn the faucet back on and now you get the distribution uh, it can also Anyway, so that can be helpful. You never know what happens in our world today as far as strange things. So um, <clears throat> so that's that's one. Um, another thing with with this is it takes into account what happens if one of the beneficiaries predeceases you, okay? You, you don't want to disinherit the grandkids just because your child happened to die. So what we you can have within the trust, uh, provisions that a child's share would go to his or her kids if they happen to pass away prematurely. Um, also, another thing that you can do is typically we want to make sure that that whatever the distributions are would go to uh, your children or grandchildren, not to son-in-law or daughter-in-law. If somebody were to pass away, you say your daughter's married to a wonderful man and they they have two kids and she dies prematurely you don't want it to end up going to him and whoever his next wife and whoever her kids are you want it to go to you know your daughter's kids just as an example so those that's some of the things that you can do within the the living trust 
that to safeguard. So not only does it avoid probate to the extent it's funded, and that's another key there is whenever you set up a trust, you wanna make sure the assets go in. Again, whatever's within the trust avoids probate. Whatever's outside is subject to probate. Rules in Nevada, if the estate's over, if you have any real estate, automatic probate. If the cumulative amount of assets outside of the trust exceed 25,000, an embarrassingly low standard threshold there, then that equals probate. So, so the concept is to uh, stay out of court and the time and aggravation and so forth that David will discuss with you. Uh, you want to put the things in the trust. So you set up the trust, put the assets in. Basically, you forget about it. Uh, you as trustee or trustees, you can sell whenever you want. You buy, you put things in, you move it out. No restrictions whatsoever. It's all we're trying to do is, in essence, doing your probate in advance by changing the title of the assets into the trust, and then the trust governs what happens. So that's kind of the general background. Uh, explanation about trust. Now that's mentioned there's two kinds of trust. One is a living trust or revocable trust. That's the most common thing. That is an estate, it's a will substitute. That's an estate planning vehicle. Nevada has another kind of a trust, an irrevocable trust, which can give you asset protection. And so one of the common misconceptions is I have a living trust, therefore I'm invisible and bulletproof. Nobody knows what I have, and if I get sued, nobody gets it because the trust owns it, not me. Uh, that is nice in theory, it just doesn't work in practice. So with a living trust on the asset protection side, you get sued, the other guys win, you lose, they get a judgment for a zillion dollars against me, the trust is no impediment. Anybody can pierce through and attach whatever the assets are that are in the trust. Um, with the uh, asset protection trust, uh, different story. So the rules in Nevada are you can set up this trust. Again, you are the trustee. You control everything that happens, buy, sell, trade, whatever. Statutorily, there's a two-year period before the assets are protected. So the key there is not when the trust is created, but when the assets go into the trust. So you create the trust, transfer the assets in. Um, if assuming you don't get sued within the two years, after after two years that has been held there, it doesn't matter what happens uh, for the rest of your life, somebody coming out of left field, uh, the sky falls, whatever it is, that no matter what happens in your life, any unforeseen, unexpected, uh, unanticipated tragedy, uh, nobody can touch whatever's in the trust. So it's it's a wonderful thing. Nevada is ranked number one in the nation as far as the few states that have these kind of a trust. So so that's a good thing. So you can, so one of the other options in setting up a trust is you can do an asset protection trust. Again, you control everything. You control the assets, the distributions, blah, blah, blah. You You control everything. You just wait for two years and nobody can touch it. So... If you care about that, that's that's a good way to go. Um, lastly, the, the last point I was assigned to talk about was on successor trustees. So typically what will happen is people will name their child or friend or somebody close relative to be the successor trustee, the executor, the administrator, personal representative, the person in charge of taking your assets, your affairs, and uh, administering them. It's collecting the assets, selling whatever needs to be sold, pay off any debts, claims, and then once all of that, once everything is solvent, then you make distributions to the beneficiaries. So most people's instinct is to have their kids because they want to save money. Um, it's actually, it's the kids' money that they're saving, not their own because they're gone. Um, you know, the longer I have done this, uh, the more I kind of leaning towards having a professional trustee do it, especially if there's any sort of complications or other sort of issues. A um, couple of reasons why. Uh, the professional trustees, that's their job. They do it. They do it well. Um, if there is any possibility for the kids fighting with each other, um, any contention, all of that goes away if you have a third party. So they might get mad at their brother, sister, uncle, aunt, somebody, but they're not going to get mad at the professional trustee because that's what they do. 
the other thing is uh, if you have the the kids on there to do it um, one of two things happens and both of them are bad so either either the child that's selected to do it doesn't get paid and so number one the child's never done this before has no idea what they're doing and so they have to fumble around in stress and anxiety and they don't get paid and now the child feels bad or the other option is they actually do get paid and then the other kids feel bad because so and so is getting paid and they're not so you can avoid all of that if you get a professional trustee to take over and administer the estate so that's kind of the summary of everything i have sal um i guess we can we can field questions at the end and looks like david is next up on the queue that's correct. Thank you so much, Robert. Uh, that was a lot of information, very good, good information. I'm sure our attendees um, are enjoying all of the information that they're hearing today. Thank you, Robert. Uh, I want to just remind you that um, you've got that area where you can submit your questions. The questions are coming in, and we're going to be having that question and answer period toward the end of today's uh, seminar. Our next presenter today is Shannon Evans. Shannon Evans is an attorney with Evans & Associates, a firm specializing in estate planning, probate, and guardianships. Shannon was admitted to the Nevada Bar in 1991 and obtained her Series 7 securities license around that same time. In 1998, she was appointed by Congress to attend the Retirement Savers Summit in Washington, D.C., and made contributions to some of the changes that we now re are, are reflected in retirement plan contributions and portability. Please welcome Shannon Evans, who's going to be presenting on non-traditional trust, charitable planning, and protecting a legacy. Shannon Evans, take it away. Hello, everyone. Nice to see you again, virtually at least. Um, we're going to talk today about some non-traditional trusts, and that is a huge topic. But what I'm going to mean by non-traditional trust is mean the average trust is people that have children, they're married, they leave everything to each other, and their children outright. That's what I call a traditional trust. Kids have no problems, they're perfect, they have jobs, they're married, everyone's fine. So that's some people, but a lot of people have complications and wrinkles in their lives or choose different lifestyles. So some of the things I'm gonna talk about are really getting more and more common and, and Rob and David and I are saying this all the time. Let's talk about one of them, living apart together. It's called LAT. A big trend in the United States is older people such as ourselves, um, have gone careers, our children are adults, and we choose not to get married but have a long-term relationship. Well, in most states, including Nevada, if you have a long-term relationship, there's no common law marriage. So that person has no rights to your assets, but the converse happens. Let's say you're living with someone in their house and they pass away. Unless they have a trust that takes care of you, you can be kicked out by the kids immediately and some of your own assets are in the house. Also, another thing people don't think of is if you're not married in a traditional sense and you have a car accident and you don't name each other on a medical power of attorney, you have no rights to speak for the other person or make any decisions at all, even if you've been together for 15 years. So some things I do when people have a long-term relationship, they don't have to be married. But I say, you know, if you live in the same house, um, take care of each other and have something called a life estate, perhaps, where the non-owner spouse can stay in the home for her life or his life if they pay the utilities and keep the contents of the house. And when they pass away, the kids get the house uh, would be more traditional or your traditional heirs. So that's something that people should consider. The power of attorneys are super easy little form. There are medical powers and financial powers. Both are for emergencies. But if you have a relationship that you care about and you're committed to each other and you work with each other, you might consider naming each other on your medical power of attorneys. Then that's just a choice. Another thing people forget all the time is they might have adult children who are perfectly capable, but they might be on some type of government aid like SSI or SSDI. So SSI is when the government pays for a person's care because they don't have any income and they're permanently disabled. They pay for rent, food, uh, that sort of thing. SSDI is when you're disabled and your money that's been set aside in your W-2 over time is, is being paid to earlier than 65. When someone has any kind of government aid and you leave them something outright via a trust or a will or they're on your bank account or an IRA, that has two bad effects. One, they could risk losing their, their SSI or SSDI 
and they could risk losing their Medicaid qualifications merely because they inherited um, an asset. SSDI, which is your own money, it doesn't matter if you have an inheritance, but SSI and Medicaid, it matters a huge thing. So someone inheriting even $25,000, if they're on SSI or Medicaid, could lose their benefits and have to start all over again from scratch when that money is gone. So people normally do something called a special needs provision in their trusts. And Rob and David and I do this all the time. It just says that if any of the heirs or beneficiaries are on any kind of government aid, their share is held by the trustee and doesn't just go to them. And the trustee can pay for whatever they need for rent, not rent, excuse me, not rent. They can pay for things that are not covered by SSI, not rent, not food, but vacations, computers, maybe a vehicle if a person's disabled. So those terms are really, really important. And many people, I have a client who has a, a son who's not disabled mentally or physically at all, but he's on government aid because of a back injury he suffered at work years ago. So sometimes a person's not really disabled in the traditional sense, but you have to consider that they're on aid and um, not just give them the money outright because it could affect them very seriously. Another thing let's talk about, and people always laugh at me, but pets. Pets are important. Some people, pets are more important than their children or equal, yes? So if you have a pet and something happens to you, you can leave a term in your trust saying who you prefer to take your pets. It might be a friend, someone that likes animals. It might be one of your kids. It might be um, a charitable welfare institution that will take care of your pets. Lots of times people leave a little dollar amount with their pets to help take care of them for their lives. And there's something called pet trusts. That just means that you have a trust that includes some money for your care of your pets if you have any when you pass away. Everybody's pets are different. But if your pet goes to the beauty shop once every other week, gets special homemade food, you're allowed to have enough money held in the trust for your pets that they might reasonably need for their expected life expectancy uh, for their care. And then when they pass away, it goes back to the regular part of the trust, which is for kids or charities or whoever you're thinking. So I think those are all very important considerations in a trust that are not the regular traditional trust. They're just special provisions that you can put in whenever you want to. Another thing that people do in the trust all the time, and I just had this happen last week, is called the non-traditional trust. And also protecting your legacy, which is my topic is, instead of giving the money outright to your heirs, which might be children, you might consider certain terms in the trust such as, and this isn't always kind, but it can be true. I had a client who was quite wealthy and he made all his own money. When he passed away, he had three children, adults. One was a homeless um, person, probably had some kind of mental issues and drug addictions. One was a teacher and that was perfectly fine, stable person and she was fine. And the other was a young man who was finishing college. And he had his trust say that each of them got a certain amount of money in their share but they got an amount distributed only that matched what income they earned, which is called W-2 matching. So if they earned $50,000, they got $50,000. If they earned $150,000, they got $150,000. Of course, if that happens, you want the trustee to be able to pay for like health expenses and rent and things too for the person like the homeless son who was you know, on the streets. So there has to be some flexibility with the trustee in there. But Rob was talking about that earlier. Professional trustees are perfect in that situation because they have flexibility to work with each beneficiary and kind of work within the trust terms for what's appropriate for that person. So I, that's why Robin and David and I both encourage you to have some kind of backup trustee that can handle things longer term for beneficiaries as opposed to just passing out the account and closing everything. Does that make sense? Another thing let's talk about is retirement accounts and IRAs. There was a huge change last January called the SECURE Act. Basically, it upended all the distribution rules for IRAs or retirement accounts for non-spouse beneficiaries. Obviously, if you're married, you can name a spouse as the primary beneficiary of your IRA, and they can roll it over to their own IRA when you pass away. Or they can keep it as an inherited IRA, and they have to take it out over 10 years. So you have a choice, rollover or inherited IRA for a spouse. The non-spouses like children or charities, well, not charities, but children, they cannot roll over an IRA to their own. Instead, there's a new rule under the SECURE Act where you have to take your share of the IRA out over a 10-year period from when the person passed away that owned it. 
That doesn't mean a little equal amounts over 10 years. It means any amount the person wants, but at the end of the 10th year, that account better be depleted and fully paid out. And you know this intuitively. For retirement accounts, you pay income tax as you take out the distribution, right? So if you wait till the 10th year, it grew more, and there might be a bigger income tax. But on the other hand, um, you let it grow greater without income tax for the growth. So there's some really good planning techniques you can use depending on the situation for uh, your children to get the IRAs over the 10-year period. Most people just name their kids as contingent beneficiaries, and that's a perfectly fine choice. Many families, that's exactly the right thing to do. But again, if your heirs have special needs or are not responsible or might have some risk of creditors um, trying to take their, their inherited assets, you might choose to have a more non-traditional area for IRAs. One thing some people do, but it's a little technical, is they make an inherited IRA accumulation trust. That's a big word, inherited IRA accumulation trust. That's just a name for a special trust that's drafted to take distributions from an IRA for a particular person, and the trustee decides how much to pay out to them over the 10 years. And that's just a way of protecting the IRA from that person's creditors or spending habits or drug addictions and things like that. So that's a really good planning tool that's not usually used. It's kind of non-traditional. Another thing that people forget all the time, but it's a really useful tool is for charitable planning, if you're taking required distributions from your IRA because you're over 70 and a half or 72 now, just changed to 72, you know you have to take out parts of your IRA distributions every year and pay income tax. If you're doing that and you don't want the whole thing every year, let's say you have to take out $100,000 and you don't want it all, you can leave a certain amount directly to a charity that year and not pay income tax. That's called a qualified charitable distribution. Qualified charitable distribution. So that happens is, let's say your distribution is $100,000. You don't want $100,000, you're gonna take 50. And the other 50 you're gonna have go directly to Vegas PBS or whatever charity you like. It doesn't go to you at all. It goes straight from your IRA to the charity and there's no income tax in that part. So it's a great income tax reduction tool if you have charitable intentions anyways, and it's really easy to do. It doesn't have to be a permanent um, change like a trust. It can be every year, I'm gonna give this much to this charity or this much to this charity, and it's really, really easy. So I love that because it's super easy. One thing that David and Rob and I talked about today before the show was everybody, because of the changes, should review the retirement plan distribution um, beneficiary forms and make sure you named a primary beneficiary and contingent beneficiaries. Contingent is backup beneficiaries. And that can be a combination of people, charities, or qualified trusts. So that's really easy to do. Find your form, look at it, and make sure you, you think it's correct. And that's something we want everyone to, to do um, just at home. Pull out your forms and see if you have them. If you don't have them, Call your broker or the custodian and get a new blank form and fill it out. Most of them don't require a notary. You just fill them out at home or online. Some do. So that depends on every person's a little different. But I think it's really important for everyone to review their documents periodically and make sure their beneficiary forms are updated. The titling to their house is updated. This is something that we talk about all the time. A really easy thing. You have a revocable trust. You have a house that's in the trust. You refinance your house because the rates are really good, and the bank makes you take it out of the trust in your name, fund the mortgage, then you have to put it back in the trust by recording a deed. If you don't do that, guess what? The trust isn't going to work if something happens to you, like you pass away or in an accident. So it's really important that your house is deeded to your trust, even if you have a mortgage. Another thing you can do at home that's super easy, we're talking about inexpensive things that don't really require attorneys, Make sure you have a homestead filed on your house. In Nevada, a homestead protects your house up to $605,000 from creditors, and that's really powerful. So everybody can do that. If you get in a car accident and your house is homesteaded, they can't take your house. So that's a very strong protection and even extends to bankruptcy in some situations. So that's something everyone can do really easily as well. Um, and Sal's going to let us talk some more about the question and answer session about what we're doing. But at this point, um, Sal, are we ready to go on to, to David or should I keep giving some different topics? Oh, thank you so much, everybody. Shannon Evans, thank you. Very 
interesting information. Every time I come, it's not the first time I, I see a seminar on wills and trusts, but every time I learn something new. I uh, want to thank you so much, Shannon, for, yeah. for all that information. We're going to move on to our next presenter. But before we do that, I want to uh, just give you a friendly reminder that uh, we've got the questions coming in. We've got a lot, a lot of questions coming in. So keep, keep those questions coming. Uh, those of you who have been sending those questions, thank you so much. Our final presenter today is David Strauss. David is an attorney at law at the off law offices of David A. Strauss. His legal career began in 1990, where he spent three years with a prominent Las Vegas law firm before opening his own practice. David's law firm concentrates on trust, estates, corporate, and business planning with uh, an interest in asset protection, charitable planning, and entertainment, and media law. He frequently lectures at legal education seminars on topics pertaining to estate planning, among other things. Please welcome Mr. David Strauss, who's going to present on planning proactively, probate, and creditor protections. Take it away. Thank you, Sal. Um, appreciate everybody being here today. Nice to hear Rob and Shannon got some, learned some new things here today too from Shannon and Rob, which is always nice. Um, I'm going to first talk about planning proactively. And I think it's a pretty general subject and a couple things I want to bring up. And number one is, is it's easier to check into this world than it is to check out. And I think when we come in, we come in really with nothing. And we, when we leave, we have holdings and stuff that we have to plan for. So it's important to plan ahead. And I think, you know, my planning pyramid that I use for my clients to discuss proactive planning is first we focus on you first for your planning for yourself to avoid what's called a living probate. We like to make sure that our clients plan to avoid a guardianship and conservatorship because if you don't plan ahead, you'll end up in the court system having to post a bond, hiring a lawyer, doing annual accountings, and planning ahead is important, whether it be through durable powers of attorney for health and property to avoid a living probate. Uh, that's what I mean by living probate, again, is becoming disabled, and 500% more of the people become disabled rather than just pass away now. And so by planning ahead with durable powers for health and property or a funded revocable living trust is a way to plan for yourself. And there are some new laws in Nevada that were passed in 2019 uh, regarding durable powers of attorney for health and property with living probate. Uh, generally, what we need uh, you need to do is visit advisors so you can look at those existing powers of attorney for health and property, especially if you had done those prior to 2009 before we had statutory forms, because now there's a box that they want you to check to avoid having to do a guardianship if you want to stay in your own home. Or if you're going to be placed in a facility, sometimes it will require you to go to court. And that's why those new forms and new laws since 2019 are important to examine. So you come first, plan for yourself, plan ahead for living probate. Next, you know, plan proactively for how, when, and the way you want to pass your assets to your loved ones. And so I think it's important to decide how, when, and the way you want to leave your assets, whether it be to charity or whether it be to your children or whether it be to nieces and nephews and siblings and plan proactively how, when, and the way you pass those monies. Because Nevada has great laws where you can pass money to children or to loved ones in a trust where they can theoretically be their own trustee and it's free of divorce, bankruptcy, lawsuits, and creditors. And so you can plan ahead by doing that. And